Welcome to another edition of CSC Presents Tech Tuesdays. Welcome to Food Tech. And today's session is brought to you by none other, none other than CSE TV. I will provide a link in the chat, which you can see on your right. Um, feel free to ask questions today. Feel free to join in. Uh, but I won't be your moderator today. I'm just the intro guy. I'm going to welcome my friend, my colleague, Mr. Mark Francis, who is uh, coming to us from Calgary today. Uh, Mark, how you doing? I'm doing much better than I was this morning. Good. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. And uh, I'll let you uh, do your business. I just want to welcome everyone again to the chat board. Uh, this is going to be a great session today. This is our sixth Tech Tuesday. So uh, again, if you want to watch replays or follow up uh, with this and watch it again or share with friends, it will be on CSC TV, which is on YouTube. So Mark, take it away. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, James. And to all of you for joining us today. We have three excellent companies. I've heard all of these presenters myself uh, or have, a, connect, have a, a, a connection to them. We run Tech Tuesday every Tuesday, starting 15 minutes after market close, typically with three private companies at various stages from North America and abroad. Next week, we're going to have technology for orthopedic repair, Procore Biomed of Tel Aviv and Woven Orthopedic Technologies of Manchester, Connecticut. Our objective in running Tech Tuesdays is twofold. First, to help technology companies with increasing traction to gain relevant visibility. And second, to help capital markets players by introducing interesting companies, focusing on whether the technology will have commercial traction and why, and also providing new knowledge of what is happening in innovation. For you as attendees, we do ask that you share ideas and your feedback with our presenters, including leads, possibly funding after doing your due diligence, referral of someone with unique applicable expertise, or maybe even a potential strategic relationship. You can find their contact information already posted in the chat board. With respect, we might all refrain from giving management advice and thus we are truly experts in the company's particular field. And let's not treat our presenting companies as marketing targets for services. Some housekeeping matters. You will note a red reconnect tab at the top of your screen that might come on if you lose audio. Just click it and you will be reconnected. In the event that there are technical problems, we may hit the restart, in which case there is no action required by you as the system will automatically reconnect everyone. We aim to run 45 minutes to one hour. The chat board will be utilized to ask serious questions. Please be clear as to whom your question is being addressed and don't clutter the chat board. We will try to get to them. Note our disclaimer, this presentation is for information only and is not a solicitation to make an investment in either shares or debt or to buy or sell stock. CSE and Mark Francis as your session host, i.e. yours truly, make no representation about any of these companies. If you are interested in the investor pitch deck, please connect with the companies directly in order to get detailed information. Each company will have a seven minute presentation with their PowerPoint. When you see my face appear, the company has 15 seconds to wrap up. After each company has presented, we'll move to a panel discussion with Q&A, today moderated by Scott Exner of MLT Akins. Today we have as presenters, Elad Barkin, CTO of Knibble, nominated by Beyond Ventures. We have Shay Martin, CEO of Brew Ninja, and David Ziziak, COO of Botanico, nominated by MLT Akins. Today, let's start with Elad. Elad? So Elad's focus is food science and ingredient functionality with more than 15 years in the food industry, establishing and managing manufacturing facilities as well as testing and commercializing food products. He was chef and co-founder of Skinny Pasta, a leading international brand and Elad, we thank you very much for joining us uh, very late in the evening from Tel Aviv. Over to you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for having me. So my name is Elad Barkan. I am the co-founder and the CTO of Cannibal Food Tech. Uh, we are an Israeli, as you see one second. Uh, so we create fun powder food products enhanced with active materials of uh, cannabis, but we are doing uh, exactly what the market is we are doing specialty products so we are not doing gummies we are not doing uh, chocolate we are doing uh, powder based edibles 
and we based in Israel, but we are doing the development and the manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, until now, we developed a uh, unique uh, one hundred more than one hundred formulations, and we produced. Uh, we are actually selling more than thirty two SKUs until now. Uh, as you can see, we raised around one point five uh, million uh, U.S. dollars from uh, fifteen hundred investors in a crowdfunding. So, as you can see, all our products are unique, and you will see them uh, in later in the in the deck. So, everybody talking about edibles. Basically, edibles, it's the most growing market. In every uh, dispensary that you go to, you will see a lot of the people standing around the edible sections. You can see there are people from 20 years old to 70 years old. Everybody wants to try that because it's it's easy to use, it's not smoking, and uh, it's really fun, actually. So, uh, as you can see, we're doing uh, cannabis drinks. Most of our skills are drinks in powder form. And this is a big market. It's growing every year. Uh, it will go to 5 billion globally by 2026. So this uh, market has a lot of potential. As you can see, the Pelican is our brand. And the Pelican is our brand, and we have uh, various of unique premixed powder food. So we have the kind of shakes. We have the, uh, the kind of shakes that it drinks hot or cold, just add uh, milk or, or, or ice. We have the kind of shake sports. So this is segment for the sports. You know, after your workout, you can gain from our product a lot of uh, hemp protein and CBD. We have the kind of spices. So uh, as you can see, we have the pizza spice. So basically think about it, we infuse it with either CBD or THC. So every pizza became the pizza party for you. Uh, if I go back one second, we have three families of products. We have infused with hemp, so infused with hemp seeds, oil, and hemp protein. We have the CBD infused and the THC infused. We done the three segments in order to uh, gain brand recognition. Because with uh, these three uh, families of products, we can actually sell them all around. So the hemp infused ones can be sell in regular retailers. CBD, as you know, in the US and all around the world, you can sell quite easily. Even the post, uh, postal services are sending it. And THC, we are uh, producing according to, uh, to the law, to the local law. So. You cannot do that everywhere. Usually, you need to produce it in the same place you're going to sell it. But you know, every place with is with the regulation there. Uh, so this is a part of our uh, products. As you can see, we have a cake ready to eat. You know, just mix with water, twenty seconds to a minute in the microwave, and you have a cake freshly, a hot, nice chocolatey cake. You have uh, cold drinks like uh, Kanache coffee. You have the chai latte. You have uh, uh, cake pops, just add water. All of our products are ready to eat, you know, in a, in a, in a, up to a minute. Just add water, mix it, and, 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 and you can consume it. This is the uh, hemp products. Same as the CBD, but here it's uh, coming in a bigger packaging. And because it's basically a regular product with added, hemp oil or protein so uh, that's uh, unique to some kind to, to the market actually our technology this is the most interesting part so basically we know how to mix in our technology oils to a powder form base and getting it to be uh, evenly dispersed a, a distribution will be you know exact in every portion of the powder. So think about it. Until now, people are producing, uh, if it's with CBD or THC, five kilo batches, 10 kilo batches. We are talking about 500 kilo batches to one ton. So basically, we are bringing the food industry into uh, the cannabis market. The second uh, part of our technology is the flavor masking. So 
think about it, you know, in the first line of product with cannabis, people said, oh, it's nice chocolate and you almost can't feel the nasty flavor of cannabis. Uh, but for our product, it's a perfect flavor. So we know how to mask the cannabis and we can control the amount of masking. So we can leave it in 10%, 20%, or we can get it off completely. The third part of our technology is about flavor localization. So the coffee flavor we drink in Israel is not the same as the coffee flavor we drink in Canada or in the US. So we know uh, how to localize it and to get the best product to, to the certain market we want to sell in. Uh, in order to actually protect our IP, uh, we have uh, the black box. So everybody knows Coca-Cola and they are, we are actually doing the same as they do. They are selling some kind of a pre-mixed black box and we are doing the same. We manufacture in Israel uh, a black box contains all the small uh, but very very important materials ingredients that make our product so unique and when we send it send it from israel to whenever we want to produce in the us in canada in europe in australia uh, they just adding like the fillers so in fillers i'm talking about sugars flour uh, creamers all the big materials in this way we are uh, gaining two key uh, issues first of all we protect our IP and secondly we get uh, the level of the product to be identical everywhere in the world so as I said now we are producing 32 SKUs so the hemp and CBD products we are producing in uh, Florida in a nutraceutical FDA approved facility and for us it's very very important because the industry is going you know at the end it will be uh, under FDA regulations so Oh, I see the face. Let's let's run. <laughs> so uh, basically, we, we are, basically we sell for now uh, on all the uh, online in Amazon in Zulily soon on Walmart, and we are uh, dealing with all the big retailers in in the US like Whole Food, Walmart, uh, Publix, with all the buyers about selling our products there. Soon we're going to do listing in the uh, CSE. So if uh, everybody wants to learn about it more, they can contact me directly. Thank you. Perfect, Elad. Thank you very much. And now we'll move to Shay Martin from Regina. Shay has a software development background. He worked on oil field exploration software and billing inventory software, and as an AI developer for video games, including the NHL, NFL, and rugby and on military simulations for the Canadian Navy, but has always loved beer and business. So he's back combining them. Shay, all yours. Hi guys, I'm here to talk about uh, Brew Ninja and why we uh, think it's the pickaxe for the craft beer boom. So I'll start off just with some of the pain for breweries. Um, basically software is not tailored for small breweries, inventory, accounting, or taxes. Um, Oops, it's all very uh, generic, right? And so our platform makes it very specific. And another problem we found with breweries is they had really poor communication between their sales and their production staff. Um, sales staff were kind of operating like lone wolves. We've even come across breweries where the salesperson was text messaging in their sales. Um, and so now, especially as the uh, traceability requirements have increased. Mandatory tracking and reporting uh, is very time consuming and error prone for breweries. So really a holistic solution was needed and our platform tracks your inventory, your sales, uh, taxes, and the, the excise taxes on alcohol can be fairly complex. Um, we even work with your point of sale to, to work with all that. And the result is the communication between sales, accounting and production and customers all gets much better, which means you can get paid quicker. And all the traceability and re, re, uh, tracking that we're doing can save a brewery easily 36 hours in their month. So w when you're using Brew Ninja, you know the state of your brewery at a single glance. Um, the tedium of bookkeeping is done for you. We do work in progress accounting for you, and you're able to produce tax reports at a single glance. 
We've even had a brewery go through an audit with our software and uh, they'd been through a previous audit, which uh, CRA then required them to produce reports for the next nine months. And the second time they were able to produce the reports so quickly when CRA contacted them that CRA said thank you very much and left them alone. So it really engages the whole uh, brewery, um, your production staff, your sales staff, your taproom staff, all of them. Um, so we're seeing roughly 80% of staff in a brewery use the product and a brewery combined can use the product up to seven hours in a day. So those really great engagement metrics are, are the reason we've had almost no uh, lost customers. So, so I, I think timing is really important, but one of the timing things that's really exciting for us, I mean, aside from a growing beer market and and uh, just a general move towards digitization in the industry is the introduction of lot tracking. So basically CFIA is going to treat beer as if it is food, which is probably fair enough. So basically what that means is a single can of beer on, on a retail shelf, um, the brewery has to be able to trace that can back through the sale, the delivery, um, every tank it touched within their brewery and then they have to know which uh, lots from a certain vendor went and it's not just enough to know that vendor A contributed malt towards that can they need to know specifically which lot from that vendor so it's kind of a fool's game on on uh, paper and our platform uh, makes all that happen with a click of a button so we are a software as a service uh, platform we do offer, uh, uh, we do get revenue share off payments that are put through the system, which can result in, on average, about $600 a month for a, for a medium-sized brewery. And there's no capital investment up front. And starting a brewery is very capital intensive, so um, breweries really like paying this way. So... Uh, so, yeah, as you can see, th there's roughly 10,000 breweries in North America, 10,000 wineries. Um, but basically, this market has continued to grow 10% year-over-year growth for about 12 years now. I think 13% was the number last year. Um, with COVID, uh, the numbers are beer consumption is up, even if it's just changed how we're drinking it. So uh, I'm going to gloss over some of these slides. Okay, this is not the right deck. Okay, so, but basically how our platform works is the, the sales, like it starts with a purchase order. You enter your purchase order into the system. At that point, we're tracking the cost of your raw materials. And then from those raw materials, we can alert you if costs have changed. Those raw material costs, now that we have those, you enter, you schedule out when and how you're going to brew and what you're going to brew. And then when it comes time to brew that, we we uh, mark that tank as full of this content and we know to transfer that value from your raw materials into your tanks. And then when it comes time to package that product, we know we're now determining the cost of that individual can and we're adding that value into your finished goods inventory and, of course, increasing uh, the value of those assets in your accounting platform. So then when you sell, now every sale has an accurate cost of goods on the, on the platform. And also the, from the mobile platform, the salesperson can create and enter sales, which means that on the production floor, they're able to see sales come in. They're able to ensure that they can fulfill those orders which then leads to the next step is we have a, a mobile delivery app, which their delivery staff can use. So they get to the location, they bring up the delivery order and they can sign, uh, they can sign the delivery slip right there. And then when we actually send the invoice to that customer, it's got the delivery slip and their signature. So there's no disputing whether or not the goods are received or not. And basically from that flow, we are able to build all the information needed for traceability requirements for your accounting platform. We're transferring value from your from your raw materials to your work in progress to your finished goods. And because of we take care of all the tedium and they get insight into their brewery, um, that's that's the value recognized by the platform. So these are some of the breweries that we're that we're working for. 
um, a couple of the nice things breweries have had to say about us, but basically it saves them time and uh, saves them time and eliminates the error process. So I, I apologize. This is uh, my pitch deck, not my technology deck. So, um, so my I'm the founder of the company. I uh, Mark mentioned my background. My other partner is Matthew Hahn, who has experience with B two B sales. And we've slowly built up a team. And so we're at a team of six now, and we are just halfway through our seed round, which is how the decks got mixed up. And we, we've uh, closed half of our seed round. So thank you very much for your time today, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Shay. And actually, the blame uh, should rest on my shoulders. I am most certainly the person who sent the wrong deck to James to be loaded. So don't <laughs> no apologize, worries. Jay. Um, thank you very much. And our last presenter, David Ziziak. David enjoyed a 38-year career with Dow AgroSciences Corteva, where in his last role, he was the business leader for the North American Grains and Oils Unit, which was responsible for the business strategy and commercialization of a portfolio of novel oilseed traits targeted to the food and feed industry. David served on the board and also as chair of the Canola Council of Canada and is currently on the board of Protein Industries Canada. And I'd have to say your real claim to fame, in my opinion, is that you're the brother of Rob Ziziak, whom I know, but anyway, your younger brother. But David, delighted, and he's spoken well of you uh, when I've chatted with him in the past. Thank you. And thanks very much for a kind introduction. Um, so I'd like to introduce Botanico, you know, to everybody attending here. And uh, we're in the space of oilseed processing. So you think about companies like ADM and Cargill, Bungie, Dreyfus, and Richardson. And we have a very different approach to oilseed processing, which we think can unlock a lot of value. Um, you know, the demand for food is growing around the world. Um, there's a great push on for healthier eating, plant-based foods. And in that vein, we've reimagined oilseed processing. And so we can take what's in these crops today, pull out, a different set of products that create a lot more value. I really believe that we can participate in the expansion of, uh, of healthy eating, of uh, healthier foods, and of the plant-based foods industry. We're very proud of canola in Canada. It really is our crop, but there really has been virtually no innovation around how to process oil seeds. And so the focus today in a crop like canola is to really process it for its vegetable oil. And that's something that we see on the shelf in all of our grocery stores. But traditional processing is really focused just on oil extraction. And it destroys a lot of natural products that are within the seed that really could be monetized. Also, 55% of a canola crush leaves behind a protein meal. And today that product is really denatured and it's really only good for a kind of low value dairy cattle feed. And that's where we can bring, we think a lot of value into this subspace. So, We've really created a brand new way, a brand new approach to processing oil seeds. We have a water-based, an aqueous-based uh, novel processing platform. It doesn't use heat. It doesn't use solvents. And we disassemble the seed instead of crushing it. And that lets us pull out very unique co-product. So instead of making liquid oil, you pull out something called an oleozone. We can pull out protein concentrates and protein isolates. Because we're producing different products, that really lets us get us, <clears throat> that gets us into new and high value markets. We can go into personal care. Uh, we've got a great play with protein concentrates into aquaculture feed. We also, also can participate with oleosomes and with the protein isolates into the food industry. So we can really take what was in that seed, process it differently, extract new co-products, and that lets us, that gets us into new high value markets that really have uh, good uh, long-term growth fundamentals attached to them. So if we took uh, 300,000 tons of canola, like in that lower left-hand box, and then look below that black line. So a conventional processing plant would take that 300,000 tons of canola, and from it, they would pull out about $87 million worth of oil and about $39 million worth of meal, generating about $126 million of revenue, but it'd be at less than 5% gross margin if the industry runs on very thin margins. But because we're making very different products, with very different value points that are going into good growth industries, uh, we can pull out a very different value proposition. 
They can make, again, protein concentrates, isolates, pull up the oleosomes instead of liquid oil. And so from that same seed, they can generate over $400 million of revenue at over 45% gross margin. So again, just by processing it differently, we get new co-products at higher price points that take us into higher value markets, which gives us superior gross margins and superior profitability. So this really is a terrific step up and enhancement of the value proposition. Uh, so it truly is value added processing. Uh, we operate today in Calgary. We have a 2000 ton uh, facility that, we, that uh, is commercial today. And we're focused on personal care today. The plant we have here in Calgary is not large enough to do, uh, to do food and, and feed, but it does operationalize our process. So we greatly de-risk the scale up by being able to operate at a small scale, but it is commercial. It's a fully automated plant. Uh, we can make oleosomes uh, that go into the personal care industry at a very high value point. Uh, we have a US uh, commercial team based in New Jersey, and they've got really deep formulation and experience in the CPG area. We've got a great set of customers, people like Aveda, Supergoop, Tata Harper, Kula. We've got over 50 NDAs with companies in the space that we've got uh, projects in flight and in uh, development with. So we're operating today, albeit at a small scale, but a pretty high value point. What we want to do next is really take this proven technology and really take it into these underserved markets. So we validated our manufacturing platform. Uh, we feel that greatly de-risk the product development. And because we can then scale, we can get into the food industry. And again, using emulsifiers with the oleosomes and getting into the plant protein space, which is very high growth. The sales of the plant-based food industry has grown by 50% in the last two years. It's over $5 billion category here in North America today. And also gets us into aquaculture feed. So we've uniquely made um, a protein concentrate with over 75% protein. Uh, we just completed aquaculture feed trials in salmon. We've demonstrated that it could be a very significant part of global aquaculture. We're really focused around salmon and around shrimp as those are uh, high value markets that need a lot of protein, but also a very specialized kind of protein. We've demonstrated that um, we can fit in there very, very well. And again, those two categories are growing at over a 5% CAGR, and they're over $10 billion of value with very good long-term growth fundamentals given the growth in global population and the emerging middle class wanting to eat better. But it is underserved because the amount of protein that's available for that industry is limited, and they're seeking new sources. And that's why you hear about things like insects and you know, fermented products for that space. We were the first company uh, under the Protein Industries Canada Supercluster Program to receive a co-investment. That's We have a $10 million funding envelope, which we co-match, so that's direct grant money. And uh, we're very proud of that validation, but it also gives us a very good platform to accelerate uh, our R&D program and our commercial scale up. We're putting a lot of effort into establishing our intellectual property. Some things we manage as trade secret around some of the key areas that we don't want to teach anybody. But we're also filing key patents around product compositions and around product utilization. And we have a very large effort around the IP side of it, given the novel way that we're approaching this uh, space. So that really is Botanico. And we believe that we really have a transformational opportunity around OLC processing. Uh, creating access to new markets and really valuable word markets that have got really good growth fundamentals attached to them. Thank you. You nailed it almost to the second, David. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we'll bring back all of our panelists for what we call the Inquisition. So if we, Elad, and uh, if we can also get Shay back, that's terrific. And we are really pleased that our guest moderator today is Scott Exner of Calgary a partner with MLT Aikens, the leading agriculture law firm in Canada. Scott, over to you. Thanks, Mark. And uh, I thought we would start off with some questions for all three of you. And in terms of order, we'll start with the lad, move on to Shay, and then end with Dave. And I sort of start with two questions. Uh, we'll do them one at a time. Now, one of the challenges in developing new technologies or products is balancing sort of two things. One, the need for your customers to adapt your technology or your product, and two, sort of maintaining your IP or trade secrets. 
So my question for each of you is which side of that equation do you put your company on and how do you feel you're doing at managing that balancing act? So Alad, I'll let you go first. Thank you. So basically we feel that innovation is a must and we know that we cannot avoid competition. So our plan is to launch every year a new segment, a new technology, a new uh, range of product. So if on last year we uh, launched the powders for the, this year, the end of this year, we're going to launch a new, completely new product. So always to be uh, a few steps, you know, before all the market. And then we expose the new technologies, we expose the new product. And uh, until people, you know, until the competition is coming, we are already doing new uh, technology and new products. Okay, that's great. Uh, Shay, do you want to go ahead? Sure, yeah. I mean, IP is not something that we've been able to leverage uh, a ton of yet. I mean, our software is very process-orientated. It's accounting-based. So um, it's something that is able to duplicate. But, I mean, I think our strategy is simply to, um, I mean, we do offer a great customer support. Um, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. We do things a little differently than others have taken a, another different approach than others have taken. And um, uh, we're just relying, I, I, I mean, I guess similar to a lad is staying one step ahead by, by pushing new features and uh, being really proactive about listening to the customer. Okay, thanks, great. Dave, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, we view patents really as assets. And so it's a key part, I think, of generating value. We're in an industry that does not do very much in the way of R&D. And so we can protect ourselves early on by doing things like the right kind of confidentiality agreements, or the right kind of material transfer agreements to protect IP, but engage with customers. And then as we're ready, you know, we can make our disclosures as, as our provisional patents can become published. But you know, being really ready for that point in time, ensuring that we've got processes protected so that we can really create long-term value. Okay, great. Um, I think a little bit different twist, obviously with growing companies, corporate governance is always sort of an issue as companies grow. So what I'd like to hear from each of you is sort of explain your board composition and specifically, do you guys have independent board members on your board or do you perhaps have strategic advisors that are non-board members? So if you could maybe comment on that. The lad, if you want to go first. Yeah, thanks. So for now, we are in the board, only the co-founders of the company. But uh, we rely on a lot of advisors out of the board. And we think it's, uh, you know, we have to learn from the experience of other in the industry. And we are planning in the next uh, couple of months to, uh, to really, you know, widen our board and to get uh, three or four more board members. It will be independent. Okay, great. Shay? Yeah, we're in the same position. Our board is essentially the founders at this point. Um, that may change by, by the end of this this round, but um, we rely heavily on advisors too. So we have advisors who have had software companies that have exited before. We've got um, the owner of a brewery as an advisor. Uh, we've got an, one advisor who's, you know, has really helped us a lot with the fundraising round, stuff like that. So we just really seek out people where there's major de deficiencies in our knowledge. Okay. Uh, Dave? Yeah, our chair today is an independent. Uh, he's got experience, you know, managing publicly traded companies and, 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 and boards. So we really value that. So as we go through this fund, this uh, fundraising round here, we're moving towards a independent, majority independent type of, of a board but we also do rely on um, advisors quite a bit. And so you can just really accelerate our learning and the really valuable part of how we, you know, begin to roll things up and, uh, and uh, expand. Okay, great. Uh, maybe the one last question for all three of you before we sort of get into specific uh, questions about each of your businesses. If you look back over the last two years in developing your technology and products, what's the one or two things that you wish you would have known two years ago when you started? Or when that time period was to a lad? Uh, oh, thanks. So 
basically our technology is is based on on a very very wide of uh, experience for a lot of years it's not something from the past two years but uh, sure i wanted to know better uh, uh, something that regards our uh, range of products because you know when you launch pro when you launch products you put what you think will be best and because the market is still new and you cannot rely on market research research so i would done a little bit differently the first uh, series of product that we launched definitely i would change the variety there yeah yeah market research is always a challenge that's for sure yeah. uh Shay? Then, yeah the, I, the biggest thing for me would have been to start selling earlier um, i'm from an engineering background and uh, it was a little bit of the field of dreams where if you build it they will come well that's not the case i wish we would have really gone out to market before the technology was ready and started building hype and and just getting that marketing and sales engine going earlier um, that would be my biggest mistake okay uh dave your thoughts i know you've been with botanical for what is it just over a year dave or Yep, just over a year. Well, what I really wish we would have known two years ago was that COVID was coming. And uh, you know, we started our fundraise end of February, and then you know, March 13th happened, the world shut down. And so, you know, someone once said to me that, you know, you raise money when you can raise money. And um, I think you know, that sense of urgency around it and being able to really not worry about trying to perfect your business case, but ensure that you've got all the key points organized and you can present. You know, compelling value proposition and help people understand what you're uh, wanting to accomplish. Uh, you know, probably things that uh, um, you know you only learn from experience. Not what I would have liked to have known two years ago. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to get into some specific questions about each of your businesses, and maybe this time we'll start with Shay. Uh, question for you, and I know I looked at your slide deck that uh, wasn't up on the screen, but I know you guys deal with. QuickBooks, uh, for the most part, in terms of your software, exporting to that. Is there any other software, like if a customer had a customized software, would you guys be able to sort of adapt to that? Or how does that sort of get integrated to the process as well? So we used QuickBooks as a, as a proof of concept. Um, we built the integration with QuickBooks in a way that it would be able to easily connect to other platforms. Um, but we're basing that on market demand. I would say the second most in demand is probably zero accounting from uh, U U.S. customers. Um, we, I worked, like I mentioned in the past life, I've worked with billing software in the past and we connected to every accounting platform under the sun and it, it became quite difficult to maintain. So we're really at this point, uh, given our resources, really trying to focus on, on the major one. And anecdotally, that's about 70% of the breweries we come across are using QuickBooks Online. Okay, so have some of your customers requested changes to your software to sort of for particular issues that they come up with, and how have you sort of dealt with that? And if you do make those changes, do they get passed on to other customers? Yeah, we again. Uh, go, this goes back to the the billing software I worked with in the past. Is we did do a custom version from everyone. It, it just became such a nightmare to maintain. And when you make an improvement to one version, now those other people don't have that improvement. So with Brew Ninja, we have been very specific about everyone is using the same software platform. So having said that, we yes, we do get requests, very specific requests. Um, but often that if you try and understand the need or the reason for that request, um, there's maybe a way to solve that problem that many more, all the breweries can benefit for or a lot of people. And if we can prove that case out, then we put it on the backlog and give them a timeline. But there's, there's no custom development. It's just, it erodes margins really quickly. Okay. And you find your customers have to buy additional equipment to use your software that they have to install in their plant? No, there there is no additional uh, equipment required. So, I mean, I, I think that's one of the things that's attractive is there's almost no startup cost. We have seen a couple of the breweries um, install, I, I guess they've installed hardware, but it's basically a, a, a mount for an iPad and they'll put near their tanks so, or they'll put near their packaging system. Um, but that's totally optional. It's just really convenient for them. Um, our software, the packaging software, does work with an infrared scanner for scanning the serial numbers of kegs and stuff like that. Um, but I would say we probably only have about 30% of our customers using that. Most most of them are just using uh, laptops, iPads, and, and iPhones. Okay, okay. All right, great. 
Well, maybe now we'll move on to Dave uh, for some specific questions for Botanico. And Dave, I know you mentioned the trials that you've just done on your aquaculture feed. Question for you is, could you describe the potential customers for that feed? And is there any risk that you might be dealing with a small number of potential customers? Yeah, the industry has an interesting structure. And so largely, you know, it kind of was born in Norway and kind of went around the world. And you, know, you can only raise salmon in a couple of very unique climates. And so you've got this very thin band in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, we've got the right water temperature and the right kind of geography that you can put salmon pens in. And, you know, aquaculture today, we're farming more fish than what we're catching out of the wild catch. And so it has you know, pretty good growth trajectory given the, de the demand as I talked about earlier. So over time, the industry has become very sophisticated, but very concentrated. Like there's five feed companies that make up really the industry. And three of those companies represent 85% market share. And they sell to about 10 companies that actually produce about 85 to 90% of the global salmon per se. And so you know, the benefit is you've got very sophisticated people but you only have to make like five phone calls, then you're done. Um, so you want to make sure that you've really got a compelling offer, a compelling product. And we really believe that we've done that. And we've created a real breakthrough. And so, you know, the needs are well understood. It's a very transparent industry. And we think that we've really checked all the boxes in terms of product design that really fit the need for an industry that's got great needs in terms of, of ingredients. So, um, you know, it's going to make, um, you know, a short path to commercialization, which I think is very good. I'd rather have that than maybe have to deal with 10,000 people around the world to go commercialize to. Yeah. So they hold your feet to the fire, but once you're through the door, you're through the door, George. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that your existing plant is mainly focused on the personal care products and that for the aqua feed and food products, you'd be building another plant. How many facilities would you anticipate building and where do you expect to build them? You know, Canada has got this great reservoir of protein uh, called canola, and it's really underutilized today. So it's a 20 million ton crop moving to 26 million tons in the course of the next five years or so. So we have a very large feedstock to work with. And so, um, and there's a great push, you know, by the federal government, uh, by the agriculture industry to do more value added processing at home versus export raw materials. And so, you know, our initial intent is to really look at facility around 300,000 tons. Uh, but we could probably have uh, several of these plants in Western Canada because we've got great trade, great trade agreements as a country that gives us access to key markets both in Europe and across Asia Pacific with the Trans-Pacific Partnership and with the European Free Trade Agreement. And so we've got these trade routes that exist today that we can take advantage of. And, uh, and so we really feel that we've got a really good potential here to really make a significant uh, presence, you know, in the prairies, because we're doing something new and different. We don't compete with the existing players. We're just creating a new adjacent space that brings in a different value proposition. So we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. And on that note, I know Canada, you know, certainly invested into the protein sector in the last few years. Europe has sort of, sort of been ahead of us. When you look at the companies in Europe in that space, how would you compare what Botanical is doing to what they've done? I think we've got a true fundamental difference. Um, part of the issue in the past, other companies have tried this, but they've focused on taking something like existing canola meal and then trying to go pull protein out of that. But it's been so fried that it becomes a very low yield, high cost, thin margin kind of a process. Because we start at the seed level, and doing it the way that we do, um, we can pull out you know, four co-products instead of just one. And it gives us a real advantage in terms of quality because we haven't denatured the protein. And denaturing, denaturing protein is kind of like frying an egg. You know, once you fry, it's in a very different form. You know, its function changes and it tastes different. And so by not having to go through that frying process, we can start with really clean native materials and then, you know, isolate, separate, purify those, and that's what we can go to market with. So making four, four or five products instead of just one and being able to come up with a very clean process are really key differential advantages that we have. Okay, great, sounds good. Well, maybe we'll move on to a lad and uh, some specific questions for you. Now, edibles are obviously sort of a growing industry. 
and a lot of new companies and a lot of new products. How do you plan to sort of raise the profile of your products above all the noise in the industry in order to sort of market it? So first of all, uh, you, you see a lot of products in the market, but none of them are similar to our products. So first of all, we are not doing our products are unique. And I can tell you, I know the next two generations that we're going to launch because I finished the R&D for those. It's going to be interesting. We're going to launch product that never been seen on the market until now. And as I said, all the time to be innovative, to do uh, the products that everybody never thought about, never dreamt of. And, and this is my passion. This is my expertise. And, and this is what I'm doing for the past 15 years. To trying to surprise the market year after year. Everybody will know about the Pelican. Okay. I noticed from your packaging, some of them sort of highlight the CBD content, where others are sort of highlighting the hemp or the THC content. Do you have, a, uh, how is that going from a marketing perspective? Are you targeting one of those products to different areas versus the other? Yes. Yeah, so so uh, the strategy behind it is, as I said in the, in the deck before, is to go and try to, to put ourselves and our product in as many as market as possible. So if they infused with the hemp oil, uh, we can sell it on every retailer. So basically you can find it on Walmart shelves. When you go buy your milk and your bread, you will find that. And the, the CBD, it will be in a, you know, buy it online because it's differently. And the THC you can buy uh, when you go to your dispensary. Uh, and in this manner, we can, you know, put our brand in as many places as we to to get the brand recognition a lot bigger, so everybody knows that the Pelican is a is a unique and a high quality product, whatever it's with uh, hemp or CBD or THC. Okay, great. I see Mark's joined us. So, uh, Mark, how are we doing for time? Do you have a final question? Uh sure. Yeah. Um, attacking Trellin is always critical to growing a business. Do you guys feel you have sort of the existing team in place that you need for the next two years, or are there different areas where you need to sort of attract more folks? Maybe we'll start with Dave this time. Sure, thank you. We have a great core team here. Uh, we have lots to do. We're at this inflection point where we need to scale in a bunch of different parallel activities. So we've got a, a good hiring plan in place. Um, and um, you know we think that we've got there's good food science in Canada. We do that great at the university level and the industry level. So we're going to be doing quite a bit of hiring as we go to scale up our, our business. But we think that we've got uh, really, truly a great core team in place today. Okay. Elad, how about you? So although we have a very, very strong team for now, because each and every of the co-founders' is, uh, specialties is in a different you know, section of, of what we are doing, uh, I think it's very important to to get new talents and to get uh, you know uh, uh, advisors and to to get a lot more help in uh, different areas. So we know for that we need a stronger team in sales because we are selling now. So that's going to be the next thing for us to okay. build our strong sell, sales team. All right. And lastly, Shay. Yeah, actually, very similar to to Elad as well, and and. Uh, my co-founder and I actually recently just had a discussion. Um, you know, we're, as soon as this round's closed, we will be hiring two full-time salespeople. And uh, we had a very conscious discussion about my personality type, his personality type. And we want this first sales hire to be somewhere, someone that fills in our deficiencies, right? So, um, and again, we're going to leverage our advisory panel. Um, one, one of the pers of our advisors is a, uh, has run a large, large sales team before. So we're going to narrow down the candidates and we'd like him to be involved in selecting too, because we really don't want to be wrong, especially with this first big hire. So, yeah, it's always important to identify your own, uh, weaknesses and sort of fill those gaps. So great to hear that. So, all right, Mark, uh, I think I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Scott. And, you know, I have to tell our three presenters of the six Tech Tuesdays that we've now run, we've had some presenters who are really good at answering questions efficiently, but as a group collectively, you have been the most efficient at answering questions precisely and usefully. So a real pat on the back to the three of you uh, as, a, as a team. Um, so thank you 
Elad in Barkan for signing on, in particular, late at night uh, from Tel Aviv. Really appreciate it. Uh, Shea Martin from Regina and David Ziziak from here in Calgary. And uh, thank you, Scott Exner, for your time and uh, detailed preparation. Uh, by the way, MLT and MNP will be supporting another food ag tech session in the autumn. So look for that. Um, and thank you to all of you, our attendees, for your time today. Go to the company websites and learn more about these companies. If you have a lead for them, do connect. Let's help them grow. Well, thank you very much. You can see the replays on CSC TV on YouTube. Uh, you can connect with us uh, on all the different social media. Uh, unfortunately, James does a much better job of this part than I do, uh, but uh, uh, we're doing okay. So subscribe, if you will subscribe to uh, the CSC YouTube channel, uh, that will help us. And there are also some excellent replays uh, from past sessions. I urge you to go and take a look at them as well. So until next Tuesday, when we will have orthopedic companies, Procore and Woven, do your due diligence, but listen to the stories and let's help entrepreneurs grow. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.